Lord, we thank you that you are a good father. We thank you for the grace and, you, and the love that you continue to lavish on us as you draw us closer and closer into you. We pray, Lord, that that's what would happen this day, that your goodness would pull us further and further in. And as we fall more and more, that we would love you and love what you're doing in our lives. We would pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So when I was in college, I had a professor that shouted every one of his lectures. I mean, it's not because his microphone didn't work. He was just flat out angry. In every lecture, there was a hall of maybe 500 of us. He would yell and shout and pound and sweat in his uh, face would be red and he's angry all the time. And if somebody asked a question, holy cow, if somebody had the guts to ask a question, <laughs> they would stand and he would belittle and berate and criticize and critique. It was just the most awful thing in the world. I had, at the end of the semester, the need to go in and speak to him about a paper that I was writing for his class. And I just remember, I mean, that was one of the most sheepish experiences I had ever had. It's like, oh my goodness, what is he going to do to me when I get in there? And it was just as bad as in class. He berated and belittled and embarrassed, and I had scurried out of there with almost no help at all. So that was my experience with him. I mean, I had no trust in him and no confidence that I could go to him and receive something good in return. Uh, that same semester, I had another professor who was the epitome of kindness and compassion and deeply wise and just very good. And you couldn't be in Dr. Bear's class without absolutely loving the guy. So, you know, he was the kind of professor that would prefer that you call him by his first name. And if you had a question, he would offer to take you out to lunch in order to really discuss this thing. So that semester, we had a death in the family, and you know, it's one that really, gosh, it causes you to dig deep. So you're away at college, and it's like, okay, who am I gonna go and talk to about this? Is it gonna be the angry guy that just berates and belittles and makes you walk away with your tail between your legs? Or is it going to be Dr. Bear, who just exudes compassion and kindness and wisdom? So I went into his office, and we sat down, and he spent the rest of the semester with many hours, one-on-one, -on -one, just helping me to process. And he was just very compassionate and kind and helpful. So there was just this trust that you knew existed with this guy. So when something deep happened, you just had this confidence that you could go to him and he would do well with it. So if you think about the, the dichotomy there, the question that I want to begin with is, when you have something going on in your life and you want to talk to God about it, what is your expectation? Is your expectation that he's going to be like, that first professor that, you know, he's going to furl his brow and be ready to come down on him? Or is there this sense of trust that I can take this to him and know that he's going to do well with it? The word confidence. So the question is, do you have a sense of confidence in God? And I want to just take a minute and recapture the original meaning of the word confidence because it's kind of gone astray. <coughs> if we break the word down, it's con and fidere. So together with, and fidere means to trust. So confidence has this sense of a trust in what we're linked together with. Confidence. It's a trust in who we're linked together with. So the question is, there's God and there's you. Do you have a sense of trust in this one that you're linked together with? 
So I hope that you walk out of here in a while with much more confidence in your walk with God. And I'm going to give you three reasons why I think you should. The first I'm just going to touch on briefly because we um, went all the way with the last one. And it's the fact, um, it's in Acts 1 verse 3. After his suffering, he presented himself to them and gave many convincing proofs that he was alive. He appeared to them over a period of 40 days and spoke about the kingdom of God. So the first reason that I would say there is this natural trust that you can have in the Father is because of his power. Last week, we reminded ourselves that he, as Jesus, literally died and was dead for three days and then brought himself back to life. Who else can do that, right? So there is just this natural sense that if somebody can bring themselves back to life from the dead, I want my life to be linked with that life. And we mentioned last week that after he came back alive, for almost a month and a half, he continuously appeared to hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people. So we can have this confidence that he did come back to life. It was attested by so many people. And as we said last week, we've been living in the effects of that, the wonderful effects of that ever since. <coughs> so can we have confidence in God? Well, he brought himself back from the dead. And there's nobody else who can do that. So I think the answer on that front is yes. Another way that we can have confidence in God is confidence in his grace. Let's pick the Hebrews first. So Hebrews 4.15, For we do not have a high priest who is unable to empathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet he did not sin. So I just want to linger on this for a moment. We do not have a high priest. So a high priest is the one who communicates with the Father. So Christ is our high priest. We don't have one who is unable to empathize with our weaknesses because he was tempted in every single way and he passed every test. So if we, you know, we think about ourselves, and often when we're thinking about what our great temptation is, all of a sudden, we feel alone, like we're locked in a room, like no one else experiences this. But every person who's sitting in this room is tempted in at least one major way. So every single one of us has temptation. So temptation is something that is natural in life, and we feel like, gosh, I'm the only one, and how awful am I? that this is what I'm tempted with, and yet, we read that Jesus was tempted in every single way, so he understands. So when we come to him with the temptation that we struggle with, we don't come to a person who doesn't understand. Like, how can God understand what it means to be tempted in this grinding fashion that I'm tempted? It's because as a human, he was tempted in every single way. And you might think, well, he didn't have to walk through the checkout line at Lightman's and there's a hundred candy bars there. He didn't have to walk <laughs> No, but if you take every temptation, we can, there's probably three great categories of temptation that every temptation falls into. And on that one, he spent 40 days in the wilderness one time without a single morsel to eat. 40 days without eating. And at the end of that, Satan came and tempted him with food. So does he have to endure the Kit Kat aisle at Wegmans? <laughs> no, but he knows hunger. You know, empathy, the pathos part of that means he feels it. The end is in. He feels it deep within himself because he has been there. So when we consider our great temptation and whether we ought to talk to God about it or not, 
he has experienced the exact same temptation that you have experienced. Maybe in a little different fashion, but he has been there. We do not have a high priest who is unable to empathize with our weakness, but one who has been tempted in every single way. So how can we have confidence in him? Because he passed the test. In every one of those, he did not sin. Now let me just come at this from a little different angle. Say that you inherited six billion dollars, okay? And it's always been your greatest desire to own an NFL franchise. So the NFL is expanding, and you get the next franchise, and your goal is to win a Super Bowl. So what you're not going to do is to go to the <laughs> beloved Browns and ask them how to do it. <laughs> Because they've never won one. They are 0 and 50 in winning the Super Bowl. Oh. Yeah, I know. So all of a sudden, if this is what you want to do, you don't go and ask somebody who's never been there. It's probably the most disheveled franchise in the entire league. That is not the place to go. Unfortunately, you probably go to the Patriots. Maybe the Steelers. Oh. <laughs> So you go to one who has been there and knows how to do it. So when we're struggling with our temptation, we go to one who understands because he's been through the exact same thing. He is not unable to understand. So go back to those two original professors. So we're talking about your temptation. So you have a sense of guilt about this. So when you go to God with it, are you going to expect the berating and the belittlement? or the compassion and the ability to empathize. <coughs> when we walk into the throne room of God, bearing this temptation that maybe we made it through, maybe we didn't, maybe we're right in the throes of it, and what we're doing is we're going to ask God for help because there's nobody else who can. What is our expectation? God is up on the throne, and I'm down here holding this ugly bag of the kilt. What is my expectation? And that goes to the next slide. Let us then approach God's throne of grace with confidence. We can approach the throne of grace with confidence. Now let me kind of angle into this one. We learn in the book of Esther, um, she had an occasion where she needed to go before the king. And her response was, but it's known everywhere that not a single man or woman can go to the throne of the king um, unbeckoned, and there's one law that applies if you do. If you're not called, you shall be put to death, period. That was the rule in the ancient kingdoms, that if you came before the king's throne uncalled for, the law was you were to be put to death. So, wow, that really makes me want to go into the throne room of God with my stuff. However, not just any old person can do that, but his kids can. The kids of the king can. So as you walk around the edge of the doorway and you're holding this bag and you walk into the throne room because you need your dad who's up on the throne, and you look up and he catches your eye, it's going to make him want to run. <laughs> but not away. He wants you to run toward. Because his expression, rather than furling, is going to get warmer as he draws you forth. Not anybody can approach the throne of the king, but the king's kids can. So we can have trust and more confidence to approach the throne of God. Why? The verse continues. So that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. So why would we go when we are in the throes of temptation? Why would we go to the throne where our dad is? So that we can receive mercy. So that we can find grace. And that last phrase is huge to help us in our time of need. God does not want you to stay in this pattern any more than you want to be in this. 
So his goal is not just forgiveness. It's not just mercy and grace. It is to help you. When you climb into his lap, it is to, so that he can help you. Because as we mentioned last week, probably the heaviest thing that you have ever carried in your life is guilt. When you have guilt from the past, it's like being in a prison where you continually beat yourself up. And it's locking yourself in the past, which makes you totally unable to do anything productive in the present. Because you're so busy beating yourself up for these things that have happened in the past. And when you do that, your joy escapes you. And your energy for life escapes you. And eventually, even your faith can escape you when you're struggling continually with guilt. Guilt is a prison that we do not want to be locked in. So what do we do with our guilt? I just want to call us mentally to paint a picture in your mind of the king sitting on the throne. And he has this little four-year-old princess who knows that she is not supposed to get in the cooking jar. But she's in the kitchen and nobody else is there. And she just can't not do it. And I know I'm not supposed to get up and climb on the, you know? Her mind is saying no while her body is climbing up onto the counter. And she's reaching for the cookie jar knowing that this is not what I'm supposed to do, but pretty soon, She's like a chipmunk who's packing food away for a long winter. You know, her cheeks are full, and she's got crumbs all down the ruffles and caught in the lace of her dress. And she's like, oh, now what do I do? You know, I could not do it, but now what do I do? And it comes to her mind, I'm going to go to Dad. Dad will know what to do. And so she comes to the throne room, and she rounds the corner. And as he looks back and catches her eye, he knows instantly what's wrong. You know, the crumbs on her dress are a dead giveaway. <laughs> but even if she vacuumed herself first, that look on her face is a dead giveaway. The tears that would be dripping down her cheeks, these tears would be for the guilt. These tears would be for the joy of knowing that she can take her guilt to her dad and her dad is going to forgive her, give her grace, and help her. So as she sits in her father's lap, she's receiving grace and mercy and love and forgiveness and help so that the patterns in her life can change. Grace, let's kick it to the next verse. In 2 Corinthians, um, we read that God has put the world square with himself through the Messiah, giving the world a fresh start by offering forgiveness of sins. Now, if we just keep in our mind this little four-year-old princess who is now sitting in her dad's lap, and not only is she going to confess about the cookies, but she's a very organized four-year-old, so she pulls out a whiteboard, and she's like, Father, I'm just going to take this opportunity to confess everything. And so she's got it, and it's color-coded, and it's alphabetized, and it's subcategorized by a level of things. She's like, yeah, I'm just going to start at the very top. You know, and it's like, I love my AAA membership laps, and I lied to my husband about it, and then he got a flat tire, and he called, and they said, I do membership laps, and I lied to him. You know, so you're looking down the list, and you're like, this is going to be miserable because I have this whole list of things that I need to confess. And now the drips of tears are running down her cheeks. So he reaches into his lapel and pulls out this crocheted divine hanky. And he begins to wipe away the tears. And as he approaches the whiteboard with the hanky, she goes, Dad, that's not going to work. I use permanent marker. <laughs> but he wipes and wipes, and by his grace, it all goes away. And he said, you are forgiven for all of it. You have my grace, and I am going to help. And the first thing that we are going to do is have a fresh start by forgiving you for all of this. So we can have confidence in God 
and bringing him um, everything that's in our life because we do not have, the verse says, a high priest who does not empathize with our weakness, but one who has been tempted in every way and has made it through without sin. So we can approach the throne of grace knowing that we will receive forgiveness, mercy, grace, and help in our time of need. Now that little princess may look up into the eyes of her father who has cleared away her offense, and she says, but I don't deserve this. Why would you do this for me? And his answer is, because I love you. And I want us to be linked together for life. So here is the third reason that we can have this deep sense of trust and confidence in our Father who sits on the throne in heaven. And it is in this verse, simple and beautiful. We love because he first loved us. There are two great biblical metaphors that God uses to describe himself to us. A few weeks ago, we began to dig into the idea of the good shepherd. That's one of God's favorites, and we're going to get back to that in time. The other is God as Father. So say that this father has a child who just will not be assured of his love for her. Let's just, let me put this in the context of me. What if one of my three kids um, doesn't grab a hold of my love for them, but instead they, um, they research and they make lists and they begin to categorize and they bring me things so that I can sign them in order to confirm that I do love her or him. They're not confident in it, so they're going to prove it. And they begin to um, go after their siblings. Like, do you know that dad loves you? You know, can you document this? Can you find things and take them to him and sign? Can you cite it with verifiable data that the father does indeed love the children? And this one goes to, let's just, I'll just pick on Grace. She goes to her brothers and is like, do you know, do you know that dad loves you? And they're like, well, yeah. And she's like, well, how do you know that he loves you? And they're like, well, he loves me because he's dad and he loves me. And she's like, but that's circular reasoning. And, you know, I'm saying, do you know that the Father loves you? And you're saying, yes, I know the Father loves me. And it's circular. You see this? Oh, no. That's not good enough. Do you have verifiable documentation that Dad does indeed love you? Now, as the Father, I'm not going to worry so much about the two that know that I love them, but just can't quite describe it perfectly. I'm going to be a little more worried about the one who has this deep need to prove it. So I'll go into her room, and you can just imagine a stack with books and manila folders and flickering <laughs> computer screens and little candle nubbins that have been burned at both ends and half drunk coffee pots and a basket of empty five-hour energies. And I'm like, you know what? I think we need to go on a walk. And she'd be like, no, Dad, I can't. And I'm like, no, honey, I think you can. Let's go. So we would go on this walk and begin down the hill. And if there was grace, we would be going hand in hand. And we probably wouldn't talk for a good half hour. But every once in a while, I'd just give her hand a little squeeze. And in time, the squeeze would probably elicit a little, you know, smile coming up the edges of her lips. You know, it's right in it's kind of like a melon, you know, you give it a squeeze test to see if it's right. So I'd squeeze her hand, and when I knew the time was about right, I'd say, sweetie, I love you. You know that, right? And she'd say, yeah. And I would say, how do you know? And she'd say, well, 
because you're my dad and you'll love me, right? And, that's, and I would say to them, why are you working so hard to try to prove that I love you? You know, not to mention you're driving my brother's back. <laughs> but I love you because you're my daughter. You know, if you just think again, let's take a step back. There's this dad who has the four-year-old daughter. And he says, honey, I love you. And the daughter says, I know. <laughs> and the dad says, well, how do you know? Because you're my dad, you know? That's always been my favorite answer. When the kids are very little, it's like, hey, honey, I love you. I know. You know, it's like saying that the sky's blue. I know. Hey, honey, the grass is green. I know. Honey, I love you. I know. You know, that's my favorite because it's just, it's so deep in there. There doesn't even need, it's just so normal and natural. I love you. I know. I know. Wouldn't it be great if that's the relationship that we have with God? And do I love you? I know. Right? It's just so deep and so in there that you know it. We could find the greatest lawyer on the face of the earth, right? And say, we're going to pool all of our money and we're going to give it to you for one purpose. We want you to dig into every shred of evidence that God loves us that you can possibly find and write this legal brief that's cited and documented and notarized and researched to the nth degree. And they would go and do that. And they might bring back the world's greatest argument as to why God loves us. And we would read the whole thing. And at their grand conclusion, this includes all the evidence that is available anywhere in the history of the world that would still fall short of a true deep of God. Even if we had all the evidence of the world, it would still fall short. There would be a gap. And that gap is designed to be there, and the only thing that will fill it is trust. There is a tremendous amount of evidence for God's existence and his grace and his forgiveness and his goodness, but it doesn't get us all the way there. There is always a gap, and that gap can only be filled with, some people call it faith, some people call it trust, but it's just this knowledge that we love because he first loved us. And we are now members of God's family. And he has reserved for his children the priceless gift of eternal life. And it is kept in heaven for you. And God, in his mighty power, will make sure that you get there safely to receive it because you are trusting him. That final little gap that evidence cannot fill when we see him face to face, the gap closes, and we live in full knowledge. But Paul says, until then, we need to have trust. And that's what gets us the rest of the way there. One final example on this one. One of my favorite theologians, his name is Karl Barth, and he is widely agreed that he is likely the greatest theologian of the 20th century. Um, just an, uh, a genius mind and an amazing heart put together in one verse. His great work is called Church Dogmatics, and it took him 30 years to write it, and it's over 6 million words in the life. So it is this grand treatise on the love of so if there was ever a person that could mentally, logically put it all together in a way that makes sense, he's the guy. So at the end, near the end of his life, he was speaking at the University of Chicago. And at the end of his talk, a student raised his hand and said, so in all of your research and all of your life, what is the greatest thing 
that you have ever come to discover about God. And he paused only for a moment, and a smile came on his face, and he said, it's this. It's a song that my mom taught me when I was little. The greatest thing I have ever come to know about God is this, that Jesus loves me. This I know because the Bible tells me so. And then he ended. This great mind said, when it all comes down to it, it thanks on my trust. We love because the Father first loved us. So we can have this great confidence, this assurance in our Father in heaven. First, because of his power, he came back from the dead. Who else does it? <coughs> Secondly, because of the amazing grace that he has and the ability that we have to go to the throne to receive it. And finally, because of this love that we have, because he first loved us. Now I want to wrap up with this. And I'm going to use my name, but I want you to interject. So the Father in heaven looks and says, Mike, I love you. And I say, I know. And he says, how do you know? And I say, because you're my dad, and you love me. And then I say, and dad, love you too. And he says, I know. And I say, how do you know? And he says, because you're my child. God, it's just the most beautiful thing in the world to be loved by you. And I pray that you capture our hearts, that you capture our minds, that we will spend the rest of our life enjoying and growing in our relationship with you, our loving Father, who your prayer is all in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So if you knew you were going to win the Super Bowl, that you lost a few games along the way, you could handle the loss with dignity, right? I mean, it's okay if you lose a few games as long as you know you're going to win the big one, right? If you know you're going to win the war, it's okay if you lose a few battles along the way, right? That's part of life. You can't win every game. You can't win every battle. Christ is risen. Christ is risen indeed. We win. We win the game. We win the battle. We win the whole thing. So why do we walk around looking like we're defeated all the time? It makes me crazy. I'm talking to myself just as much as the rest of you. What Mike doesn't know is I opened my daily Bible this morning. There was one name at the top of the page. Jeffrey. It was 22 years ago that Mike's nephew Jeffrey died. That's the death he was talking about in the beginning of the sermon. Last Sunday, Mike said, what if he had erased the incident of sending the check to Princeton and instead he went to Michigan to seminary where he met me? Part of what influenced his decision to change seminaries was Jeffrey. One life, he lived six days and then he died. Impacted their family in a huge way. It was a loss. It was a grief. Some of you know that. You know how hard it is to lose someone you love. How do we get through it? Christ is risen. Christ is risen indeed. What if we live this week as if we believe that? You're going to lose some things in this life. It's going to be hard. Every day is not going to be easy. But if we can remember Christ is risen, Christ is risen indeed, and we can apply that into our situations that cause us to. This week when you struggle, say to yourself, Christ is risen. Christ is risen indeed. And if you see someone struggling, say to them lovingly, Christ is risen. Christ is risen indeed. One day we will rise with him. Amen? Amen. Amen. Please stand with me. This last song we're going to sing is called I Will Rise. It starts out like this. There's a peace I've come to know when my heart and flesh may fail. We struggle sometimes. We lose. But there's an anchor for our soul, and we know it is well. One day we will rise. It's the promise in Revelation 21. No more pain. No more sorrow. No more tears. I can't wait. So in the middle of the junk we go through in this life, 
Remember, we will rise just like Christ because of Jesus. As you leave today, may the grace of the Lord Jesus, the love of God the Father, and the power of the Holy Spirit help you live into resurrection victory. Amen. Amen. Amen.